Uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the need for speed. In particular, the items that we will be covering are process and planning, project methodology, how to maintain quality with project velocity, cost, alternate project deliveries, and then we'll end up with some tips and tricks and the key takeaways. Faster, better, reduce cost. Is this possible? Well, just in my career alone, um, starting in the late 80s, the need for speed in communication has changed drastically. I mean, the speed of communication has really been improved over my career. Starting in the late 80s, if there was a set of drawings that had to be delivered, we would have to UPS them or FedEx them or perhaps use a bike messenger. And then came the fax machine, which was terrific. Uh, you couldn't really send drawings that way, but you could send letters um, that really changed the speed of communication. And then fast forward to today, and we're basically emailing or uploading just about everything. So it just in a relatively short time frame, the speed of communication has changed drastically. Now, this is nothing new to other industries. An example of this is in the mobile phone industry, which has really changed drastically over the last few decades. Uh, they, this industry really understands the need for speed, first to market and change quickly. The first cell phones that hit the market were big and bulky. And then we had the flip phones and then we had our beloved Blackberries, which I think I still have mine because I really did love the keyboard. And now we're on our iPhones and Androids uh, and uh, with the iPhone 13 out sometime this year. The cell phone is a great example of the need for change and speed. Now, this is nothing new in the construction industry. Uh, there's definitely a uh, fast paced delivery for projects and these can either be owner driven Perhaps there's a new school that has to be designed and built and open before the next school year. So it can be an owner driven or it can be contractor driven. It could be because perhaps the fabricator who's um, making the steel, cutting it, could have an opening in the fabrication shop and they're in a rush to get to fill that opening in the shop or it could be because they know the price of steel is escalating and they wanna hurry and rush in the mill order so they can order the steel before the price goes up. Or perhaps they just wanna get paid and they aren't gonna get paid until they deliver the product. So these can be the reasons why there is rapid project delivery in the steel industry. Now, Gary Berman wrote a, a are writing a chapter in the book called uh, Sticks and Bricks for the American Bar Association. And in Gary's writing, he says, in the steel construction, there are dis distinguished steps, like certain steps that you have to take. These are methodical steps. They have to go A to B to C. And if you skip any of these key steps, uh, there can be unintended consequences and mistakes can happen. Right? So the systematic process for steel construction is, well, first, you're probably familiar that you're gonna do the architecture and the engineering. That would of course be the uh, first step. And then the next step is more of a specialty trade. We actually do a lot of this in our office. This is connection engineering. And the next, and the next step would be detailing and then fabrication and then erection. I'm pretty sure everybody out there today is very familiar with the architecture, and the engineering that goes in to produce a set of contract documents. I'm sure, so we're gonna skip over that, but I'm not so sure everyone is familiar with the other trades. So it's good to just, um, you'll come across it at some point, but we're just gonna go over the key points. Well, the connection engineer, which is the next step after a job is awarded, designs basically all, it's a specialty trade, it's a branch of structural engineering, it's more or less a specialty branch, and they design all the structural steel connections, basically connecting all the steel members together. And they typically work for the steel fabricator. The detailer has a very, very important role, because once you issue the, the, the contract documents, they'll create their own 3D model, and then they'll create shop drawings for each individual piece of steel. 
So each piece will have its own individual shop drawing, which the fabricator uses. And then they also create erection drawings, which is basically a guideline or a, a, how to put the pieces of the puzzle together in which the erector will use. So they have a very, very important role on a project. The fabricator then fabricates from the shop drawings, fabricates the steel, they cut it to the exact length, they put the holes in there, they weld certain things together. Uh, you can see from this picture, this is uh, from a fabrication shop for one of the projects that we worked on in the Chicago land area. And then the erector, of course, once the steel is delivered to the site, the erector will unload the steel and then put the pieces together following the erection drawings. Those are the, the key roles for the steel construction industry. Now it can be helpful um, to understand what are the contractual relationships between the different parties involved in steel construction. Typically, I would say this one is the most typical, but there is this, you can really shuffle this stuff around, but typically the owner is gonna hire the architect and then the architect leads the design team and hires all the other design trades, such as the, the structural engineer, the mechanical engineer. And then the owner will also hire a general contractor. Perhaps they might hire a construction manager also, but the own, uh, owner will hire the general contractor. And a general contractor is basically the leader of the orchestra, the orchestra being the construction side. The, under the general contractor's contract will be the other key subs, which include the fabricator and the erector. And then the detailer and the connection engineer typically work directly underneath the fabricator. Now on certain projects, now there can be benefits to this. I think projects in which the erector works directly underneath the fabricator has a little bit more team, uh, team effort going on, uh, looking out for each other's interests. I, I think this is a good way to go, but there's advantages and disadvantages, but this is also fairly common. And something that we'll talk about later that's somewhat common is that the sometimes the connection engineer and the detailer can be moved up the food chain and work directly underneath the engineer record, or perhaps even the general contractor or the construction manager. So it, things do get mi mixed around depending on the project. Now for projects with an aggressive schedule, or even if there's not an aggressive schedule, but if for sure if there is an aggressive schedule, the key thing is planning and scheduling. So everyone knows when they are expected to deliver their piece of the puzzle. Typically the construction manager or the GC will come up with a scant chart that shows when everything is due by all the different trades and when you have to have your part done. Once this is completed, the fabricator is responsible for coming up with a sequence plan. So they'll take the drawings and they'll divide them up in sections, basic, basically based on where the cranes are placed. And then they'll fabricate and deliver the steel and it will be erected in order of that sequence, sequence one, sequence two. And in order to meet the sequence dates, the detailer has to have a detailing schedule when they'll have the shop drawings ready. But in order for the detailer to meet their shop drawing schedule, they're dependent on the connection engineer to meet the connection design schedule. So it all kind of has to be come together with very distinct dates that everyone has to meet. So very, very schedule driven. Now there's, no matter how good the contract doc documents are, there's gonna be questions along the way. There just is just interpretation questions, coordination questions. And if we have a, a linear method of communication and basically it's like the game of telephone that we played at birthday parties when we were kids, is that there'll be a question from the connection engineer and they'll have to send it to their client who would be the detailer. And they'll have to send it up the food chain from client to client to client all the way back up to the engineer record following the proper protocols. And if the question isn't clear or if the response isn't uh, exactly what the question was asking, then we have to start that whole process all the way around. So that is the linear communication model. And sometimes jobs go this way if there is closed communication and the reason for that is because if something is said or asked that has cost implications, all parties wanna be aware of the cost. But on an accelerated schedule, there is distinct advantages in using more of a collaborative or circular method of communication 
And this is becoming more and more popular on jobs that are time critical. And in this method, all the players come together either on uh, biweekly phone calls, at least once a week, and discuss any kind of issues that any team member is having, whether it's on the design side or on the construction side. And uh, these can be very beneficial for project scheduling and accelerating the whole delivery of this deal. Uh, it's been very beneficial. You can use GoToMeeting go to or Teams. There's so many programs out there or Zoom. Um, very beneficial now that, that when all members collaborate. Now, if it is open communication and there are all of these conference calls, it's still a good idea to document exactly what was said and make sure everybody agrees to what was said. Otherwise, you can end up in a situation as we said, they said, like, oh, no, we didn't say that. So, uh, written documentation that gets circulated and everybody signs off on uh, is, a, is a really good practice. And we found this has been very beneficial on a, a couple of our projects. Now, if we surveyed a room of general contractors and asked them, what are the blockers? What's preventing you from meeting schedule and getting your projects done on time? Probably the number one response would be incomplete documents. I think that would be the biggest blocker on, on, the, contra on the contractor side. Uh, one thing that is good that there is a case document. I don't know if you're familiar with case, but case is a coalition of structural engineers, over 200 engineering firms got together and created this coalition. And one of the things that uh, they had done is create a document. The mission of this, of this group of structural engineers is to improve the quality and profitability of structural engineering. And they have this documentation with a checklist uh, to help structural engineers to make sure their documents are complete. There's pages and pages of this document, but I just pulled out a, a few key examples like coordinated dimensions or the dimensions coordinated with the architecture. And this last one, architectural constraints for such things as door openings and other architectural conflicts. I actually don't know if that's in this document, but I was talking to a fabricator earlier and they asked me to include this one. Well, they probably got burned on this recently. So I threw that one in there. But there's a very good document for engineers to use to make sure that they their drawings are complete. Another thing that can slow a project down is overly conservative requirements on the contract documents. Maybe perhaps the architect or engineer is in a bit of a rush at the end to get the drawings out to meet their own deadline. And they push it out with some conservative requirements on the contract documents, but this is only gonna really delay the project in the big picture because it's gonna be too penalizing and it's gonna cause the need for either a conference call or an RFI um, um, and, and things, things we'll have we'll to, have to. I don't know if I have it either, there. but um, let me try to continue on. So things will have to be uh, coordinated and afterwards anyway. So it's almost two steps, one step forward, two steps backward. And a classic example of this is column splices, which are the vertical members in the building. They have to be spliced basically every other, maybe every two floors, they're spliced. And if the engineer requires, the design team requires full strength, that can be very penalizing. The odds are pretty good. They're gonna get uh, an RFI and delay the project on that. That's just an example. Another example is, that can delay a project is delayed RFIs or decision making by any player on the, on the design side or the construction side. Now, RFI, if you're not familiar with the term RFI, it stands for request for information. So on the construction side, if there's a question that needs to be answered, they'll submit an RFI to the design team for their, uh, their response. And typically they have one week or two weeks to respond. But if it's super critical, the construction team will request a 24 hour return. Now, another thing that can delay it is the, a project are changes. The earlier in the construction phase, the change can be incorporated, the better. You can see from this chart, if there is a change before the drawings go out to bid, probably no big deal. Once it's in fabrication, this cost goes up. 
but once it's erected, then it becomes field work and the cost really goes up. So the sooner the better, I mean, changes are a part of our industry, they're gonna happen. It's just the sooner the better for cost purposes. All right, so things we can do to manage the blockers, um, our tracking, RFI response time, we, keep, we always keep on our projects an RFI log, whether we're on the design side or the construction side, on the construction side, we need to get the answers. On the design side, we want to make sure we're not accused of being late with the responses. So either way, we keep our own log for those reasons. Uh, discussions, open communication is very beneficial. Or workarounds, if you just something is blocking you, just kind of work around it and circle your way back. Now, we can also take a lesson from the software community. Over recent years, well, I guess maybe for a while, and other probably other industries too, but definitely in the software community, software community has recently changed the way they deliver projects. Historically, it's been more waterfall project methodology, and that means they do part of their program A, and once A is done, they move to B, and once B is all tidied up, they move to C. And found in the software community, more agile project methodology can be very beneficial. It's similar to like eating the red layer cake, eating the green layer cake, then eating the orange. A more efficient way is to kind of eat the cake all at once, more short sprints to the end. And this keeps things flexible. It understands this project methodology understands that the criteria isn't necessarily locked down and the decision-making isn't locked down day one. So it's more flexible for changes down the road. If we look at a uh, chart. This comes from um, Bernard Kappa in a paper he wrote for Orthogonal, which is a software company. He says, in the more traditional method of waterfall methodology, if you, if you do it step by step by step, if there's changes, it's too far gone. The project's too far gone. We've already completed the early stages. So changes are going to be very costly versus more agile approach, where it might take a little bit more time in the beginning but down the road, it will have big payoffs. An example of this in the engineering community would be for uh, an example would be for a vertical brace connection. The brace takes the lateral load pushing on the building. Not uncommon to have it tucked in tight to the column web, very common. But if there's anything blocking the column shaft, they're not gonna be able to slide the beam and the gusset down the column shaft and they're gonna be forced into pushing it out. So it's kind of like you have to work all together, looking at all components at once. And this is just an example of agile project methodology. All right, so in our programs in our office, we try to do this and uh, stay flexible, predict changes will happen. If we're working for uh, a contractor and they want to use a certain bolt size, but mm, turns out that bolt just doesn't have enough strength and they want to use the same bolt on all the projects, so we'll just, so click, 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 click down in a spreadsheet and they all change at once. But we stay flexible that way. We set up for changes. We put in all our design programs thinking, no, we're gonna try, start with option A, but down the road, we could easily change to option B if something pops up. Communication, on the design side, you wanna change something because you feel like maybe it's it can be reduced. <laughs> it could actually cost more money to reduce because if the steel has been ordered, you're basically buying two beams. So communication is good and avoid kind of unnecessary changes. Continual feedback from your clients is always good. Uh, an example would be if you design something 100% to the end and then present it to your client and they're like, mm, we don't really wanna do it that way. That's too costly for us. And then you're gonna be circling back. Now, obviously we can't do this for every little item, but for key items with significant costs, it's good to have continual feedback. Verification and validation. Uh, this is when you're doing your calculations. Um, just a good idea not to wait to the end to make sure that everything is okay, uh, but to continually validate and verify the results. In spreadsheets, this is easy enough to do with conditional formatting when things can change colors, bells and whistles can go off. We typically use red in our office common warning color, whether it's in our spreadsheets. We also manually verify, engineers are, love writing their own programs, but of course we always manually verify to make sure that the programs are sufficient. And lastly, a 
big part of agile project methodology is understanding that mistakes happen. They're going to happen. And a key part of this is to learn and track from these mistakes. So and we actually keep a form in our office of lessons learned on projects. And we continually update this form. And then at the start of a new job, we'll either go over it with the client to make sure things don't happen again, or just review it internally to make sure we remember our lessons learned. All right, so wrapping this section up, other things that can impact scheduling on steel construction would be fabrication and erection windows. Fabricators can get really busy and they might not have openings in their shop. Transportation issues, mill order. If you have some specialty steel and you have to hurry and get the order into the mill so it can be delivered on time. Labor avail availability. This is a big one in big cities like New York and Chicago with a shortage of laborers. And probably the most critical one in today's world, I mean, this is impacting uh, engineers on a couple projects that I'm aware of, and that is material availability. If there's any shortage of certain types of material, it's good to know that in advance, so you don't have to redesign a project after it's hit the streets for bid. All right. With the need for speed, it's very important to maintain um, QAQC or quality with project velocity and avoid the rush to failure. A classic example of this is the Challenger explosion. For my generation, this was a big deal. It's one of those incidences where people remember where they were when they heard about the Challenger explosion. It, so it, I'm sure a lot of people out there probably weren't born when this happened, but it was a big moment, in, at least in my life. I remember exactly where I was. Now, there's probably some NASA buffs out there that. Are, are experts on the Challenger explosion, but no doubt the need for speed, although it wasn't the, it was a perfect storm. Usually these kinds of cat catastrophes are a perfect storm. Although it wasn't the only reason, it certainly was one of the components what caused this explosion. Now, technically the main cause was an O-ring failure, which kept the gases tight. And it just happened to be a really cold day and the O-rings lost their resilience in the cold. And there was a lot of little parts that all came together. But one of the parts was that it was well known that the O-rings um, had some questionable performance in cold weather. And it was well known. But um, one of my favorite books is Norm Delante's um, Beyond Failure. He has this book where he writes about different engineering failures. And in this, there's a chapter on the challenge Challenger, in which he says that um, the need for speed and the, to meet schedule and deadlines was one of the reasons for the Challenger's failures, that managers were told to take off their engineering hat and put on their management hat so that the launch could go on as scheduled. Uh, also, uh, I'm a licensed engineer in Canada, and to practice engineering in Canada, you have to take an ethics test. When I was doing the reading for that ethics test, there's also a section on the Challenger explosion. And in, in the Canadian reading, they said that the part of the scheduling of the launch was driven by, by financial and political reasons. And they changed their project methodology from only launch when the engineers can prove it safe to launch unless the engineers can prove it unsafe. So this is a classic example where the need for speed can get you in trouble. Another interesting example would be the Titanic, uh, which I only saw the movie twice, honestly, but at least in the Hollywood version, the need to meet schedule and even be ahead of schedule uh, and ignore the warnings of the ice fields to reduce your speed uh, was one of the components of the Titanic failure. Now, just as a fun fact, taking a sidestep, a fun fact, that was actually, uh, although it was one of the causes, it wasn't the main reason that the Titanic failed. Although they were aware of the ice fields and they did not reduce their speed, they certainly weren't in a race to break any kind of records. They were just doing standard practices at the time. But it's really interesting, the need for speed came into play more on the construction of the Titanic because there was such a shortage of rivets and qualified rivets installers that they went to like sub-tier contractors for the rivets. And it was really more due to the faulty rivets 
just interestingly enough. Okay, so many industries that have this quality concern, it's not just the engineering and the architecture community, uh, the automobile industry, the aviation, the aerospace, the medical device. And in this example, the nuclear industry has it, uh, it definitely has a, a concern with, with quality and, and hazards. So this is a, this, a couple of the different organizations or industries have what we call ha hazard analysis documents. And this one comes from the nuclear industry. And you might think that this is for a nuclear plant, the overall plant, but this is actually just for the lever, the lever arms in the plant. They have a whole document related to the hazards that can happen just due to these levers. And in this document, they go over all the processes that have to come together in order to have quality work product. You have your resources, you have your design requirements, you have your constraints, you have your information from the preceding phase. All this comes together for the work output. Now, you can download this document, it's pages and pages long, but in there, they have, they go over some hazards versus reduced hazards. And we won't go through all these, but I think it's good to kind of hit the highlights of some good ones in here like a potential hazard. And I think that this would definitely apply, a lot of these would definitely apply to the engineering and architecture community. But hazard would be reward short term goals versus reward supports achievement of safety and quality. All right, another one could be reacts only to problems or establishes a culture of safety as an organization. I like this one because we uh, did a couple jobs with another engineering firm over the course of several years. And their company policy was every meeting a company had, every company meeting started with a safety tip. And talk about a company that had a culture of safety. That was unbelievable. One time it was snowing and their safety tip was, you know, how to drive safely in the snow. So, so uh, I thought that was a really good thing that that company did. All right, so heavy dependence on QA at the end of the project. Four technical processes are designed to prevent safety and quality issue, issues as early as possible in the development cycle. Right? Engineering models are not sound, basically garbage in, garbage out, versus model inputs are validated. And lastly, mistakes occur. However, processes are not designed with resilience to protect from such mistakes versus the technical process includes process to detect and recover from mistakes, i.e. verification. All right, with project acceleration and critical schedules, there's going to be additional cost. Now, whether you get paid for this or not is a completely different matter. Sometimes you do get paid and sometimes you don't. But what causes this additional cost? Well, number one, it can be additional hours. People on your office are gonna to have to work additional hours, put in overtime, and you could possibly require additional staff to be placed on the job. Well, you might think that, well, either way we have to put in those hours and either way you have to staff the project. But as you might know from school, after a certain amount of hours in the day, you become less and less effective. So if you have people that have to put 12 hours in, probably if they keep going, they're going to become less and less effective and it's very likely mistakes are going to happen. So there's increased cost due to that. And then if you just want to throw a lot of people on the project, that also can be costly because it can be too many cooks in the kitchen and you can be tripping over each other. And then on the design side, if the construction side is rushed, Perhaps the submittals won't be as clean and as precise as they should, causing additional review time. Well, that is another reason. Also with accelerated construction schedules, there is increased risk because we're designing very fast. So there's increased risk, mistakes can happen, more likely a chance of a claim occurring. And on the construction side, you can have multiple trades working on top of each other, which can also be a safety issue. Right, so it can be beneficial to look at different project delivery methods to facilitate the need for speed. We're not going to talk about all of these. I mean, 
they all had their similarities. A lot of them are very similar, except for the contractual relationships between the different parties. But we'll hit the highlights of a few of these. Traditional design bid build, this is 90% of what happens in the Chicago land area, I would say. I think that's safe to say. Um, that is when the design team works together, issues a set of drawings, it gets bid, and typically it goes to the lowest bidder. Not always, but typically it goes to the lowest build, build, bidder. Design build, this is on the design side when we're working on the design side, this is my favorite. I love design build projects. This is where, um, although there's a single point of contact to the owner, which is the contractor, the architect, the engineer, and the contractor kind of all work together on the design side to make sure the project comes in on budget and is on schedule. Uh, this is Chinatown Branch Library. We actually did this with, with SOM and White and Company. They were the contractor and they were, uh, I really enjoyed that project. It was, it was wonderful having the contractor's input on what can help schedule and what can help cost. I thought, I really thought this type of project went well and there was very limited RFIs. The project won all kinds of awards too. So that was a lot of fun. And then we have design assist. With design assist in this way, the owner also hires key members of of the construction team, such as the fabricator or erector to come in and help the design team make decisions to make the project more constructible. Typically on projects with design assist, there's a re, um, reduced amount of RFIs and it can also help on schedule because their drawings will have no potential issues on them that will inhibit the constructability. All right, so another thing that's becoming more popular is early detailing. What early detailing is, is the connection engineer and detailer move up the food chain and either work for the engineer record or construction manager. And when the drawings are issued for bid, they include that connected model and all the shop drawings and all the erection drawings go out to bid with the contract documents. Engineers, some engineers love this because they maintain control. They wanna see X, Y, and Z, and they're gonna make sure they get X, Y, and Z. Now, if the name of the game, if the mission of the project is to get steel in the shop, let's get steel in the shop, this can be a big advantage. Fabricators all see the same drawings. They know what they're bidding. They price it. They get awarded. The steel goes in the shop. All right. So there can be a big advantage. However, um, and another advantage is, is that usually the detailer and the connection engineer have a lot of experience on the construction construction side so they can help the engineer make some decisions, right? Now, some disadvantages is that perhaps what is shown on the shop drawings isn't really preferable to the fabricator or erector. Uh, a big part of steel construction is the cost of the connections. If a piece of steel costs $5, the price of connected steel might cost $20. So the connections can really drive uh, a project. And so fabricators like to be very involved in that part of the decision-making to make sure that cost-effective connections are provided. I think early detailing could work well if it's done right. And also you have to watch um, if there's any assemblies that the pieces are such that the fabricator and erector can lift them and ship them in a profitable way. And so those are the, some of the advantages and disadvantages. Some, if you, uh, pull a, a room of different fabricators and erectors that have worked on these early detailing projects, you probably will get a very mixed bag result. Some will say it's been very successful. Some will say it's been very challenging. And some will say it did not work out well at all. Some fabricators and erectors dislike this method so much that they drove the code of standard practice. Now, if you're not familiar with the code of standard practice. What this is, it's a document that, well, in steel construction, there's a lot of different players that have to come together to build a project. It's, it's, it can't be done by just one company. It's a lot of players coming together. And there's agreements and understanding between these different members of the, of the group. 
So the code of standard practice kind of controls what these agreements are and who's expected to do what. And in this document, <laughs> uh, some fabricators and directors disliked this early detailing so much, they drove this language in the code of standard practice that says this delivery system of fabrication and erection documents is discouraged. The preparation of fabrication and erection, doc erection documents is very specific to the needs of the fabricator performing the work and is an integral part of the constructability. So it's a real mixed bag out there, but if it's done right, I think it can go well. And then we have delegated design. I think this is a great way to help with the engineering schedule. Uh, we do this in our office all the time. Uh, delegated design, um, um, the engineer stays focused on key aspects. And for certain items, they, uh, they delegate the design to other engineers who specialize in the design of those elements. Um, it's good because it allows then the fabricator or the erector's input but it can be very, very beneficial. I suppose a con would be that there could be an improvement on schedule if everything was shown on the contract documents and if it was done right. So just to hit both the pros and the cons. Delegated design is covered in the code of standard practice that's also included in there. And in there, it says, if you are gonna delegate your design, you still maintain responsibility and you still need to give the design criteria criteria so the delegated engineer knows how to design or what they are to design to. Now, even if you're gonna delegate the design of let's say the connections, the code of standard practice does say you still have to put certain things on the contract documents. So when the project is being bid, the contractors will have an understanding of how much they have material they need to include in their bid. An example of that, that's in the newest code of standard practice, is main member reinforcement such as doublers. See, I don't know if you can see this screen. I don't know if I even have a pointer uh, right here in the beam, which are very costly uh, for the fabricator. So even if you're gonna delegate the design, the code of standard practice says, hey, you still have to put in an estimated quantity of how many might be needed for bidding purposes. All right, things that, that are commonly delegated are the structural steel connections, the stairs and railings, very commonly delegated, precast panels, the joist and joist girders, composite deck, concrete mix, concrete formwork, and interior studs. These are just some examples of items that can be easily delegated to help with schedule. All right, and lastly, we're gonna just go over a few key tips and tricks. Uh, there's a lot of input from different people for these tips and tricks. They all didn't come from me. Um, usually get a lot of input when I'm putting presentations together. A good one, of course, for speed is to automate your design as much as possible. Uh, we did a job, a couple jobs with Floor, a uh, big engineering company. They were the EOR, we were the connection engineer, and they came up a, a, with a way to automate their uh, delegated design, how they present the forces. And we came up with a corresponding way to automate the receiving of those forces. So it was really nice as an exchange of data and it allowed for things to be done very quickly and automate it. And if there was changes, it was really no worries because it was just a fresh exchange of information. Revit models are wonderful. You probably know this. Uh, they can really help see the big picture for coordination or or the detailer's model in SDS or Tecla or an ISC model. Um, just using a three-dimensional model can be very beneficial for, for time. When you're starting a project, it's good practice, at least in my mind, to always start with a design criteria. So everybody on the team knows what they are to design the project to. And if you are starting a new project on the construction side, one of the very first things that can be very beneficial is on day one to get a, all the questions out there in a startup RFI so there's no delays down the road. On the design side, when you receive those shop drawings from the detailer, <laughs> it can be beneficial to the project to know when it's appropriate to either, a, to if there's things wrong, to either mark as B action, you know, approved exception notice, or what we call C action, revise and resubmit. Now, 
As a practicing architect or engineer, you can be under great pressure to review the shop drawings and approve as noted. But if they miss the mark too much and you notice something out in the field wasn't incorporated correctly, then the project's really gonna be delayed. You're gonna have to start because now things are erected and they're in the field. So there are times, I mean, if it's too far off, it's best practice, at least in my mind, to go ahead and reject the shop drawings, even if there's a, a little delay in schedule, it's a lot better than a big delay in schedule down the road. I don't know when to, when to use the right stamp. Favor field bolting over field welding. Um, these are for column splices, the vertical members in the building that keep the building, uh, take all the gravity and lateral load down to the ground. And they have to be spliced. Um, basically every other floor is the typical splicing, like every other level that these columns are spliced. And you have to connect the different pieces together. Now these can be welded or they can be bolted. Now if you do a welded, it's considered full strength and done, but it's very labor intensive and it's not necessarily a safe either because in the temporary condition, the column isn't as stable as when a bolted condition. So there's a big cost difference between these two especially in big cities like Chicago and New York where the price of field welding has just gone off the charts. We were pricing a job with a fabricator and the engineer showed all field welded column splices and they wanted to know if they could be switched over to bolted. And they've asked us this question before and on sometimes we say, no, nah, it doesn't look like they can. And this time we're like, oh, oh yeah, definitely looks like this should be able to be switched over. And I don't remember the exact difference in cost, but it was in the, it was in the seven figures. So I was shocked to see the difference in pricing between the two. This slide comes from uh, Dominic D'Antonio who works for WW Erectors. And he even says that there, the labor pool for field welding is so much less than the labor pool for bolting. Well, that's the reason why uh, not only is it, it's less safe, but it's just a shortage of workers, which drives up the cost. And also if you can do large assemblies, um, if it works, large assemblies are good because it limits the number of pieces, although you have to watch the shipping constraints. Standardize as much as possible. Now you might think, oh, we're gonna optimize the structure and get it, everything down to as little as you can, but that actually can be more costly. This is just an example of how standardization can be helpful. Um, these are seated connections. We don't really use these that often anymore. I have the slide in here because this is when I first learned this lesson. Uh, it wasn't exactly like this. This might be an exaggeration, but you could design a seat for each beam size and try to optimize the steel, but it's actually cheaper some to just group it all together because now the fabricator is only making one seat. So standardization is key. Symmetry, this tip comes from Bill Thornton who works for Surveys as a steel fabricator. And he's, he's right on with this. No matter which way that column gets turned around backwards in the shop, it's gonna fit on the base plate. No matter which way that tab goes on the column gets turned around backwards, it's gonna work out great. So symmetry is key in our industry. Assign clear roles. And now this is a good one. This lesson I learned, like don't ask why, but how can I help? This was something that I learned decades ago when we were working on a project. We were at the tail end and we were a little late. We we're designing the screen wall at the top of the building for a fabricator. And we were running a little behind and they called and they, they weren't mad or anything. They, well, maybe they were a little mad. They covered up pretty well. They didn't yell or they just asked us, what can we do to help? And we told them, oh, maybe do this, give us a model, things like that. And it really motivated our team and pushed us past the finish line. And I actually keep that attitude today. If anybody's falling behind, it's really, what can I do to help? And I think that's a, a good teamwork exercise. Manage the documents from job to job. Um, hopefully somebody on your team is very organized and can keep the documents very organized. So you don't have to waste time looking for things. All right, in the end, these might get a little engineering friendly, um, but these come from some tips for some fabricators that I know um, for the engineers out there. Just consider that beams overrun 
You might think a beam is 12 inches deep, but it can actually come out a little deeper. I once watched uh, a rector in Chicago during my lunch hour try to erect a beam for 20 minutes. Should have taken like five minutes because they just couldn't get it in between the plates. There wasn't enough gap between the plates. Avoid knife connections. If you have plates really close together, it can be really difficult to knife the beam between the plates. Consider the column shafts might be blocked. You won't be able to slide the beam down the column. And don't make your connection so wide that you won't be able to swing the beam into place. You have to have room to erect a beam. It's usually dropped in and then rotated. So you have to make sure there is sufficient room to do that. Fabricators, especially in Chicago, love single-sided connections. It's just a good engineering tip to use single-sided connections whenever possible. And lastly, <laughs> that was pretty engineering heavy. Lastly, for more tips on the need for speed and how to innovate, you can go to AISC's website. AISC is a technical organization that helps promote steel, and they have some uh, tips on their website. And one of the more recent innovations in our industry has been SpeedCore that was developed by Ron Klemetsik and MKA and a couple of other things on their website. So just a, another food for thought. And the key takeaways on the last slide is the need for speed can be accomplished with a well thought out plan. Agile project methodology can be used to facilitate project completion and key steps to maintain quality, take key steps to maintain quality with project velocity. And with that, I thank you all for coming. I think we are.